I'm super excited to see um, a lot more consumer facing applications powered by blockchain technology and specifically uh, with the Bitcoin network. Think about the Venmo and the PayPal of the world uh, secured by, by Bitcoin. These are the things that we haven't seen before, which represents a significant opportunity uh, for entrepreneurs to get used to Bitcoin script, get used to the Bitcoin um, environment and trying to, to double down on it. It's Monday, April 22nd, 2024, and this is Markets Daily, a show where we get into the minds of some of the smartest and most experienced investors, traders, analysts, CEOs, people who are making big moves in the space who have smart and hot takes. I'm Jen Sinassi. Before we get into our discussion today, let's take a look at what's going on in the markets this morning. The Bitcoin halving happened on Friday, and we saw some last-minute volatility surrounding event. This is usually a very bullish event, but something feels a little bit different today. We're going to talk to our next guest about that in just a few seconds. But if we take a look at the numbers this morning, we are back in the green. For more on the market's action, let's bring in 21 Shares VP and Head of Strategy and Business Development for Digital Assets, Elie Zé Ndinga. Elie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Jen. All right, let's talk about the having. It's what everyone was waiting for. It took place on Friday. We've had a few days to cool down and and uh, reflect on what happened. Uh, talk to me about what you're watching. No, for sure. Uh, this is a watershed moment for the entire crypto industry. Uh, for the first time in history, uh, the inflation rate for Bitcoin dropped uh, below 1%, uh, now at 0.85%. Uh, and most importantly, Bitcoin reached an all-time high before the halving. Over the past you know, 12 to 13 years, uh, we've never had a all-time high ahead of the halving. Uh, and this happened uh, many days, many weeks before uh, the halving happened on uh, the 20th of April. And then most importantly as well, uh, the Bitcoin structure changed so much uh, ever since, uh, especially since the last halving, because for example, the uh, revenue from the miners really comes from the block reward, as you know, but also from the transaction fees. Um, and as a matter of fact, the transaction fees on the Bitcoin network spiked to uh, $120 on average um, in the past week or so, uh, which is unprecedented. Um, this incentivizes the miners, of course, uh, to be able to plug in and secure the network with uh, you know, hashing power. But then most importantly, what we're seeing today is that the transaction fees on the Bitcoin network are 24 times as large as the, the transaction fees that we see today on Ethereum, uh, close to $80 million in fees. Um, and this is something that we haven't seen before with the rise of runes and new protocols built on top of Bitcoin. So this is the best case for even the layers and the scaling solutions built on top of Bitcoin. Think about you know, uh, the uh, Fed wire and the banks building on top. We're seeing the same narrative and the same developments as well with the Bitcoin uh, network where we see stacks and more uh, layers built on top to build essentially a DeFi economy on top of the Bitcoin network. This is and something that we haven't seen before and this is really incredible. Let's talk about runes for a second. You mentioned transaction fees. They were to, through the roof. They were over $146 for a medium priority transaction and at $170 for a high priority transaction. That was over the weekend. This morning, it looked like they had come back down. What does this tell you about the future for the Bitcoin network? Like, What do you expect to see here? No, absolutely. I mean, the future of the Bitcoin network um, is going to rely both on the base layer as well as on the scaling solutions built on top. And I think for the scaling solutions built on top, allowing consumers like you and I to transact for remittances or uh, doing day-to-day -day payments or even business-to-business -business payments, uh, this is going to happen on top. Whether it's only going to be on the Lightning Network or Stacks or any other layers on top, um, and the best indicator for uh, the market to see uh, will be when the uh, stablecoin issuers will be on top of these scaling solutions so that you know fiat backed stablecoins payments uh, could happen uh, on top of the Bitcoin network. You could also see uh, you know stablecoins built on the back with that Bitcoin as collateral. There are multiple innovations that we could see uh, on the back of uh, the Bitcoin network that we haven't seen yet. 
uh, which is great news down the line, even for the miners to be a lot more incentivized to secure the Bitcoin network, and then for the entrepreneurs to ensure that consumer-facing applications could be affordable uh, for uh, multiple people around the world. And today, to be very honest with you, half a billion people have access to crypto. So this is exciting to see that we could cross a chasm and having more consumer facing applications, starting with payments uh, that could make sense for multiple people around the world. Uh, so I'm really excited for that. Ellie, what does this mean for the price of Bitcoin? And I ask you this because the halving is supposed to be this very bullish event. You mentioned at the beginning of this interview, we hit an all time high before the halving happened. The price seems to be like trickling up and down, not a lot of movement, not a lot of volatility since the halving. But something interesting is that that price doesn't really skyrocket until some months after the halving. Some of those charts right. have been making the rounds on social media to say, you know, just hold on. It's actually one year after the halving that we're going to see the price um, really take off here. What's your perspective? What does this mean for the price of Bitcoin? Sure. Uh, and I think, you know, what we do really well at 21 shares is looking at, you know, history and blockchain data and market data to understand, uh, you know, what may be the best indicators for uh, market participants. Um, I'm going to give you an example. So over the past 10 years, uh, Bitcoin experienced about 43 times um, a drawdown of more than 10 percent, 43 times. This is a chance of having a drawdown of 10 percent within a day once every quarter, if you extrapolate that moving forward. Um, and when you look at that, in 2023, we had zero days with a drawdown of more than 10%, literally. This is an exception. So we should be expecting uh, more volatility. But on the back of that, given the fact that Bitcoin has a supply shock, as we know today with the halving, and then most importantly that we have the rise of investment vehicles like exchange rate funds or exchange rate products in Europe that allow access for banks and brokerage accounts to Bitcoin, specifically uh, the supply uh, to some extent could be unlimited. Um, and of course, the total support market for Bitcoin uh, for the individuals is you know, people having access to the internet uh, you know, via their smartphones or any other devices. But at the same time, this could also be another market as well, which is a market of you know, financial advisors and wire houses like UBS and Morgan Stanley, and of course, more institutional investors or even uh, sovereign wealth funds having access uh, to Bitcoin as well. Um, so, of course, over you know, the long run, uh, we know that there is a supply of 21 million Bitcoins. We have to input the coins that are lost forever or dormant or the coins of Satoshi Nakamoto and then extrapolate that to uh, the total support market. But I, what I would say is that we should be expecting, of course, uh, a lot more volatility, uh, but then more subsequently, a lot more interest uh, from an educational perspective from many people that were historically histor uh, you know, skeptical to have access to this asset class. So this is exciting. I don't have a price tag, to be very honest with you, uh, but I would be expecting a lot more volatility going forward. Ellie, I want to turn now from Bitcoin to Ether. I know that ARK Invest and 21 shares have applied with the SEC to offer a spot ETH ETF. What do you think the likelihood is that we see an approval on that product uh, in May here in the United States? No, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for asking this. Uh, as you know, we have a pending application, so we cannot specifically uh, talk about our pending applications uh, with the SEC. Uh, but we're quite excited to give an easy access uh, to investors as long as they want it, of course, um, to multiple crypto assets, starting with Bitcoin and Ether. Uh, but uh, I cannot give you a specific, uh, you know, uh, odd on uh, whether this will be approved or not. Uh, but we are definitely excited to give an easy access to crypto. Um, and we will wait for an answer from uh, the financial regulator. Okay, if we move away from your application specifically and look to Hong Kong, they've approved a spot Ether ETF over there. Just, I want to get your perspective. Um, does this put Hong Kong in an interesting position when it comes to the competitiveness of ETFs? Or maybe you think this puts some pressure on the United States when it, it comes to the potential for having this product here? No, absolutely. I think a great tide lifts all boats, right? Uh, so 
this is fantastic for the asset class uh, to see more regions opening up to exchange traded products, uh, whether it's in Europe or in Hong Kong or in other places. Uh, this is a great way for people to have an easy access with their banks and brokerage accounts. Uh, this is what people need. And we've seen the pent on demand as well uh, in the US uh, for, for Bitcoin. Um, and we could be expecting a lot more as well uh, with uh, over, over products. And uh, this is really exciting for the asset class. Okay, and outside of Bitcoin, outside of Ether, when it comes to your work and what you do, um, when you look at the crypto space, what are you most excited about? What are you watching? It doesn't have to be anything that we've spoken about today. No, absolutely. So, so we touched about, about this a little bit earlier. Um, so I'm super excited to see um, a lot more consumer-facing applications powered by blockchain technology, and specifically uh, with the Bitcoin network. Think about the Venmo and the PayPal of the world uh, secured by, by Bitcoin. These are the things that we haven't seen before, which represents a significant opportunity uh, for entrepreneurs to get used to Bitcoin script, get used to the Bitcoin um, environment and trying to, to double down on it. Um, and this is really exciting to see that uh, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the Stacks environment that are looking into this space very seriously or leveraging the Lightning Network. We've seen that with Conveys as well uh, in all the firms. Uh, and I think um, these are the things that really excites us because uh, this is going to really allow us to cross the chasm uh, and making sure that people get more comfortable. And we've seen that in the early days of the internet where people were actually quite scared to use credit cards to buy, you know, buy tickets or, or any other uh, activities happening over the internet. And we're still there on the consumer facing side with, with Bitcoin and, and Ethereum and of course over base layers. Um, and I think we are going to see coming out of the last bear market, a lot more consumer facing applications starting with payments uh, that could allow people to be a lot more comfortable with this asset class without even realizing that they're using blockchain technology. I mean, think about the volume of stable coins, what well, US stable coins um, in 2022, it was well over $18 trillion. Um, the entire year compared to $14 trillion for Visa and $7 trillion for MasterCard. So clearly we see the need for having access to, uh, you know, a fiat backed wrapper on the blockchain. Uh, and again, the rise of tokenization as well shows again that multiple financial institutions, even BlackRock, for example, launching Biddle, uh, really shows again that this asset class is here to stay, that people do not just want to launch investment vehicles, but also trying to leverage technology. The same way we've seen media companies leveraging internet protocols like TCP, IP, and SMTP for sending emails. Uh, and these are the things that, that will really help the asset class to move forward quite quickly. And uh, this is coming really fast. Ellie, we do got to wrap here, but I have to ask you, since it sounds like you're very bullish on the Bitcoin ecosystem, Ethereum was thought to be that consumer facing chain. I know there were several issues that Ethereum still has to solve to gain mainstream uh, adoption and that ecosystem is working on solving some of those problems. But do you think that Bitcoin could uh, overthrow or outpace Ethereum with all the developments that are going on in the Bitcoin ecosystem when it comes to being a more consumer facing chain and offering um, different ways to interact with the ecosystem? I think it would take some time uh, for, for Bitcoin to mature and reach the scale of Ethereum um, because of the fact that 70% of everything that is happening within DeFi really happens on, the, on Ethereum and Ethereum layer twos. Uh, we see also non EVM chains as well, like Solana coming to rise. Uh, trying to compete directly with cheaper fees and faster settlement time. Um, so I think there is a lot more competition uh, when it comes to the smart contract vertical. Uh, think about you know the, the war between iOS and Android. Uh, we see the same thing right now uh, if you want to extrapolate to blockchain technology as well. Um, so, so Bitcoin is in and of itself super interesting because as a store of value, this is a clear winner. Uh, but as a smart contract platform or as a payment platform, uh, we have yet to see uh, how dominant it could be. Uh, but I still think that as long as we have consumer facing applications where the base layer is decentralized, uh, censorship resistant and accessible globally for people with the right risk controls, uh, this is exactly what you know people like you and I would need. Um, and I don't think people would try to figure out whether they're using, you know, 
Android or, or iOS unless you have to update your, your operating system, right? So uh, these are the things that I'm really excited about. And uh, I think from a uh, security perspective, of course, Bitcoin is the world's largest uh, blockchain in the world, clearly the most secure uh, by, by multiple metrics. Um, so I think this is really exciting to see what would happen as well on the Bitcoin network. But uh, definitely Ethereum is a force to be reckoned with um, and also the layers on top. Ellie, thanks so much for joining the show this morning. Thank you for having me, Jen.